Up until now, we've mainly discussed poverty in a fixed or static setting. We've looked at the current economic circumstances of individuals and families, discussed how to measure if they are currently poor, and considered policies that may change those circumstances by providing assistance or other actions. An equally important question, however, concerns the time pattern or persistence of poverty for individuals, and especially the dynamic effects of poverty both within and across generations. In the final two modules in this course, we'll consider the long-term effects and correlates of poverty. Does living in poverty today, for example, predict or cause effects on individuals in the future? We'll begin by describing the many well-established correlations between poverty at one point in time and current or future outcomes such as educational attainment, health, or future income and poverty. Next, we'll try to interpret correlations between poverty and various outcomes such as these and evaluate the likelihood of a cause and effect relationship between poverty and other outcomes. We know that in the U.S., the fraction of people living in poverty has been relatively stable, fluctuating between 12 and 15 percent for several decades. The stability in rates of poverty, however, can describe two very different situations. First, it could be that the same set of individuals are poor year after year, so that poverty is really a chronic or persistent condition. Second, it could also be that poverty is random, a short-term condition that affects a different set of individuals each year. If we believe that poverty is a concern because it reduces the quality of life, impairs current or future productivity, or simply violates notions of fairness, it's easy to see how the first scenario of chronic poverty affecting the same individuals year after year might be of greater concern. Thus, an initial question to ask is which of these two situations comes closest to describing the experience of poverty in the U.S.? The figure looks at all children and asks for how many years they are poor over the course of their 18 years of childhood. The bottom shaded area in the first column shows that 63% of children spend no time poor at all over the course of their childhoods. This is evidence that the U.S. tends to be a society in which the same people are poor or not poor for many years. The story is not that clear cut, however. A substantial fraction, 17%, of children are also poor for only one to three years over their 18-year childhoods. 10% of children are poor for a substantial portion of their childhoods, or for more than nine years. The figure also shows dramatic differences in the poverty dynamics of black and white children. In the U.S., just 23% of black children never experience a single year of poverty during their childhood. At the other extreme, more than one-third of black children are poor for more than half of their childhood years. This picture of substantial persistence in poverty, with a small group of individuals being poor for many years, applies to adults in poverty as well, although poverty among adults is somewhat less persistent than among children. Given that much poverty is persistent, it turns out that simply observing that an individual is poor in the year of their birth, or that they are born into a poor family, predicts that many will be poor for a number of years. Poverty at birth is also predictive of elevated probabilities of many bad outcomes later in life. This figure shows the population and divides it into those who are poor in the year of their birth and those not poor at birth. Then it shows the likelihood of a variety of outcomes measured when these same individuals are observed at ages 25 to 30. First, we see that there's a substantial correlation between poverty at birth and being a poor adult. This is referred to as the intergenerational correlation in poverty status. Those born into poor families have a 20% chance of being poor as young adults, compared to a 4% chance for those born into families with higher incomes. Educational outcomes follow a similar pattern. Those born poor have more than a 1 in 5 chance of not finishing high school, compared to less than 10% for those not born to poverty. Rates of teen childbearing are also increased by a factor of about 3 for those born into poor families. Looking at employment status of these young adults, there's no statistically significant correlation between having consistent employment at ages 25 to 30 and poverty at poverty status at birth among men. For women, however, it is the case that poverty status at birth predicts a reduced chance of employment as a young adult. There are also well-established connections between poverty and health. 
This figure shows the life expectancy beyond age 25 and shows that it increases as income moves above the poverty line. Among individuals who are poor, additional life expectancy at age 25 is approximately 49 years. For those well above the poverty line, or those at or above 400% of the federal poverty line, this number rises to nearly 56 years. This elevated mortality may come from a variety of underlying health conditions that are more likely to be experienced by the poor. This figure lists a number of chronic health conditions and diseases, and then shows their rate of occurrence by annual family income. Once again, we see that poverty is associated with elevated odds of bad health. For example, the risk of ulcers is roughly double among the lowest income group compared to the highest. Rates of diabetes, stroke, bronchitis, and many other specific conditions are similarly elevated among the poor. These correlations are dramatic and provide good reasons to invest in ways to reduce poverty if we want to improve educational attainment, well-being, or health of the population. The key question, however, is what drives these correlations? Importantly, does living in poverty or having low income cause these later health problems or limit education? Or might it be the case that it is poor health and low education that instead cause low income and poverty? The question of cause and effect is a critical one, and untangling the answer is challenging. Let's consider all of the different ways in which the observed correlations or the coexistence of poverty and poor health, education, and other bad outcomes could come about. First, we should of course consider the possibility that low income or poverty somehow does cause these negative outcomes. If we believe this relationship is a causal one and move in this direction, there could be large gains to reducing poverty since it would also reduce the incidence of these related issues. There are, however, many other competing explanations for the observed correlations. The most obvious alternative explanation is, assuming that poverty and other outcomes are observed simultaneously, poor health or low education may cause poverty. There's much evi evidence that shows that poor health and low education limit earnings potential. The question here is really whether that is enough to explain the entire correlation. As we'll see, there is evidence suggesting that some causality runs in each direction. A simple way to partially identify cause and effect in this scenario is to measure poverty or income in one time period and then look at other outcomes in a later period. With the measurements taken at different times, we come closer to zeroing in on what may be a causal relationship. Using differences in the timing of observed poverty and associated outcomes doesn't always fully answer the question of what is causing what, but it can eliminate certain possibilities. Another important possible interpretation of these correlations involves additional factors that may have caused poverty. For example, perhaps a parent's poor health led to family poverty that affects a child. Of these other causes of poverty could be things such as a parent's limited education, a weak economy, or simply bad luck. That child may then grow up to face some of the negative correlates of poverty. The challenging point here is that it is also the case that whatever caused the child's poverty may also lead directly to associated negative effects. For example, Perhaps a parental health condition is hereditary or environmentally influenced and so is passed on directly to the child, regardless of whether or not it also causes the family to be poor. In this case, poverty did not cause the associated negative effect, but will appear and will be correlated with it. As this diagram shows, the relationship between poverty and subsequent health, earnings, or educational outcomes, among others, can be quite complicated. To understand how best to address poverty and its possible negative effects, social science research frequently grapples with sorting out these different possible pathways. To recap, the correlation that we observe between poverty and a variety of negative outcomes can be driven by at least three types of relationships. First, it may be a true causal relationship in which poverty causes the later problems. Second, it may reflect what is sometimes known as reverse causality, in which the negative outcomes themselves actually cause poverty or reduced income. Finally, there may be other potential factors that cause both poverty and the associated negative outcomes, sometimes referred to as omitted variables. This issue of correlation versus causality, illustrated here in cartoon form, is at the root of much research on poverty and in the social sciences more generally. 
In the next module, we'll explore how our understanding of this causal question has evolved over the past decade or so and the nature of current social science evidence on this issue.